Good morning, everyone. I didn't hear that. All right. Good morning, everyone out on the Internet, too. Glad you're all here. We have a crowd today. Boy, that's going to make for a good potluck this afternoon. Yeah. Say, I've got uh, I've got something to uh, correct here on the on the bulletin that you have. It says sunset 709. Well, there's a controversy. One one phone says 705, and the other phone another phone says 706. So, if you're really counting on the minutes, you know, or or if you're a sun watcher, then of course, if you live in the mountains, then you really can't see the sun go down. <laughs> It goes down behind that mountain, but it's got another 30 minutes. Oh, anyway. If you'll all rise <clears throat> and take up, well, we'll sing, uh, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place, after which we'll have the opening prayer by Mr. Buddy Brown. Everybody sing. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Mr. Brown. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day of atonement, Father. We worship you, we honor you, we thank you, Father, for all that you do for us, even giving us this day at this time to reflect on our lives of the past year on our future give us a chance father to grow grow closer to you to make us understand more about you and what your the things that you want for us in the future we ask father that you'll be with us now during this meeting and for the rest of this day in jesus name amen amen, amen. okay if you'll take your hymnals or watch the screen Turn to page 22, praise ye the Lord, the Almighty. Praise ye the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. Grab your hymnals. <laughs> the 22, verse 2. Praise ye the Lord, who o'er all things so wondrous he reigneth. Sheltered ye under his wings, ye so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires are heavy? He ordained. Praise ye the Lord, O oh, let all that is in me adore him. All that have life and breath come now with praises before him. Let the amen sound from his people. Again, gladly for us we adore him. Beautiful song. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to page 68. 68. And that is, There's No Friend to Me Like Jesus. <clears throat> Our 
our best friend. There's no friend to me like Jesus. He my every need supplies. He not only saves but keeps me. Nothing good from me denies. Yes, in Him I'm fully trusting. Yes, through Him I conquer all. For I know He saves and keeps me. And He'll never let me fall. Oh, yes, all to me is Jesus, blessed Redeemer, Savior, God. And from every foe defends me, and in Him I'll never hide. Yes, in Him I'm fully trusting. Yes, through him I conquer all, for I know he saves and keeps me, and he'll never let me fall. I will never cease to love him, he who died to set me free. Now in him I am abiding, and someday his face I'll see. Yes, in him I'm fully trusting, yes, through him I'll conquer all. For I know he saves and keeps me, and never let me fall. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> and now for our announcements and the offertory or off offering Mr. Larry Watkins. Whoa. Well, good morning everyone. Good morning. Hope everybody's feeling well this morning. Good shi bright shiny faces this morning. No one's having any pains or agonies or anything like that. I get a lot of frowns back at me. I better be quiet here. I may get lynched after services today. So, Anyway, it's the Day of Atonement. Everybody's been looking forward to this day, I know. Uh, certainly a high day on God's Sabbath plan, and we certainly are thankful for that as well. Be sure you look at your announcement bulletin today, although there are not a lot of new things in there. Continuing the local charity food drive, and then over here the Wagner... Uh, craft basket. Uh, where is Charles? There you are. When is that going up? You know, Wednesday. Wednesday. So if you had some last minute items, you could possibly bring them by the office tomorrow or Monday or maybe even Tuesday, I guess. Is that true? Sure. Okay. I'm sorry. Tomorrow. Nobody be here tomorrow. I thought you guys were, you know, six days a week. Okay. Oh, well. I've been wrong, wrong about a lot of things. <laughs> Anyway, you can still, on Monday or Tuesday, preferably as soon as possible, make additional amount of donations. Uh, also, on the prayer request, uh, it is not on there, but many of you may have already heard, but Mr. Ron Elkins from the Texarkana Church area died uh, Tuesday? Or when, was it Tuesday or Wednesday? Tuesday. Charles is shaking his head, so it must be Tuesday. And the funeral service is tomorrow. I think it's at 1 p.m., uh, at the small town up in three. three. Oh, three. Okay, I thought it was one. I read. I guess I read it wrong. Um, and also, for those of you that did not know, is in here, the, the lady at uh, Trumpet Services, Barbara Marlowe from the Shreveport area, that fell. She died uh, Monday morning. I think it was Monday morning or Sunday morning. One of the two, Sunday or Monday morning as well. So, uh, evidently, the surgery was just too much on her system. She was diabetic. It had she had a, a pacemaker, I think it was, or a stent, one of the two just difficulties at that age to come through all that so keep their family in mind as well uh, anybody else have any particular mentions for the prayer request okay, we've got a couple of members of our congregation uh, yes ma'am joy
That's that's Bill, right? Bob. Okay, I, I got the first letter right anyway. Uh, Joyce nephew Bob, who has, was diagnosed or thought had cancer, had surgery yesterday, and they think it's it was cancer. So continue to pray for him as well. Um, as I said, a couple of members of our congregation not here today, feeling well. Betsy and Faye, neither one are here with us today, but you know, they're here with us in spirit, and be keeping them in, in your prayers as well. Anyone else? Okay. Um, so we will go right straight on into the uh, announcement for the offertory. I think all of you are very familiar with the scriptures, and I didn't even bring my Bible up here, so I can't quote them completely by memory. Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 16 is the scripture that many of you have turned to many, many times, uh, probably at least once a year, every year, and maybe two or three times a year, every year. But let's just look at it anyway. It's, it's the reason we're here in the sense that God gives us these days to remember things, to continue to renew that spirit and that, that, that knowledge that we have. But in Deuteronomy chapter 16, in verse 16, it says, Three times in a year shall all your males appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Spring Feast, and the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles, all compassed into one. And we should not appear before the Lord empty. And every person, every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessings of the Lord thy God, which he has given to you. So there is the one of the key scriptures in, in this particular situation. Every person shall give as they're able and according to their blessings. And only you know that, and it's something we, of course, should prepare for and think about and, and not just make it a last-minute situation. I remember years and years ago, some of you would probably recognize this, uh, I was counting the offering up at Big Sandy during the Feast of Tabernacles, and Mr. Herbert Armstrong was there. And he is prone to do things like this, and he got up and he wanted to have first a very noisy offering. So I asked everybody to dump every bit of change they had in their pockets into the offering plate and I just sunk because I, I had only rented one or two coin machines and we had over 10,000 people there or close to it so I quickly got on the phone and called the bank and asked him to send somebody up in an armored car with two more coin counters <laughs> so you never know what's going to happen and then he asked for a silent offering folded stuff green stuff and then the regular offering came along so we were there until well after 6 o'clock that night counting that and then had the bank come up with an armored car to pick it up. It was one of the most harried things I'd ever gone through. But the, the point is in all of this is we come prepared. We come today before God to honor him, to worship him, to serve him. And there's nothing more private between God and us than the offerings, the tithes, the things that we do, our money, and our form of worship to him. It's not any of our business, anybody else, what anybody else does. You know what you're able to do. You know what God has blessed you with. So this scripture certainly gives us the way we should go. Turn over also, if you would, to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and a favorite scripture of mine, which I have used many times before. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning verse 6, it says, But this I say, he which sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. But every man, according as he purposes or as he plans in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, not of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. This is not something that, you know, we, we just feel like we've got to do. It's something we should come before God with thankfulness for the bounty of the land that he has given to us. Everything belongs to God. He lets us use it, borrow it, and take, take, use it as we go along through life. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. I am continually amazed over the years of the bountiful blessings that come our way as being a part of God's calling, God's work at this time. And I know each of you feel that same way. But we are what God relies upon as human instruments to carry out his work on this earth. And it's because of each of you that we are able to do the things that we do here at the Church of God International and all other organizations around the world. You know, we are in this together. We're you know, co-workers. We're partners, whatever you want to call it. We're all working together to do the same thing. And this is just one part of that. And certainly ahead of time I will say thank you 
on behalf of the church and pray that your spirit, your feast, and all will be wonderful coming up at the Feast of Tabernacles. And um, just out of curiosity, how many of you going to the land between the lakes? Okay, any of you going down to Florida to the CFN site down there? Now there's a, two of us, Kitty and I. Oh, there's, there's some more. Here we go. Um, where's anybody else going? Wagner. Wagner. Okay, I forgot about Wagner. <laughs> some, I think, going to Branson. Yeah, see if you're going to Branson. Okay, we're sort of picking it up. Well, again, no matter where you are, you will be with God's people, and I pray safety for you as you travel, and certainly have a wonderful feast, and we'll see you back here after the feast. We will be holding services here on the Sabbath right after the feast ends on Thursday. I think the feast ends on the 14th. That would be the 16th here, if I'm correct on that. 12th. I'm wrong again. That's twice in one day. That's, that's, a, that's a record. <laughs> Benny, why are you grinning? <laughs> so I think it's the 14th, that Sabbath. So anyway, we will have services here at the regular time, regular place, and everything else. How many of you right now think you'll be back here then? Well, we'll have a reasonable good crowd. Good. Okay, well, we'll see you then. But in the meantime, Trish is going to come up and play the offertory music. They'll come forward to take up the offering. <clears throat> Okay, so y'all want to sing with me a little more? We'll do some special music today. Uh, grab your handles and stand up, please, before the sermon, and turn to page 123. One twenty three, tell me the old, old story. Everybody know this? I hope so. <laughs> Tell me. 
For our sermon today, Mr. Jeff Reed, who is going to tell us about Jesus' love. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Before I get into the sermon, I wanted to make one more announcement. Uh, This is for really the webcast, people watching the webcast, and if you're going to watch the webcast while you're at the feast, maybe you might want to check out some of the other feast sites that we have on the webcast. So we've set up a website. Uh, There's links on the front of our webpage, cgi.org, to armorofgod.info, and I'm going to add more links after today, so I'm going to make it so that if you're looking, you're going to find a link to get you where you can watch the webcast. If you're watching on this right now, you'll be able to watch the webcast from Myrtle Beach on Channel 1. On Channel 2, you'll be able to watch uh, Land Between the Lakes webcast, and on Channel 3, we'll have the St. Pete webcast. So three different webcasts, there's a website to get there, all the technical things have been worked out, so it should work. I'll be monitoring to make sure. <laughs> but uh, we got that set up and for, for, for everybody to have that service. All right. Day of Atonement. All right. So what makes the Day of Atonement different from Passover? Different from Passover. I think I have a certain uh, predisposition to think of atonement as just a kind of a fall version of Passover. And maybe some other people may think of that in a way. And I guess it's natural, because this day we look to the, the finished work that Jesus did when he was crucified. And again, we generally, on atonement and Passover, we talk about many of the same things during these holy days. And I want to consider Hebrews 9. We're going to look, we're going to look a lot of Hebrews, and we're going to look in... We'll, we'll get there, but let's look this a little bit in Hebrews 9 as to start with, a couple of verses in Hebrews 9 and verse 24. Uh, to say why, 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 I, why I say this, that, that there's things that, re, that in Passover and Atonement that we kind of look at them as, as, as similarities. So Hebrews 9 verse 24 tells us, uh, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And again, we can definitely, if, if we know anything about atonement, see there's a connection there with what's being said here in atonement, because this is what happens, if, as we'll read, uh, that happened historically on the day of atonement, entering into the Holy of Holies. He says, verse 25, Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place, every year with blood of another, he then would have had to suffer since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So we're looking to that sacrifice that Jesus Christ gave for us when he was crucified. And that was actually on the Passover. It was on, you know, right before unleavened bread. And as it appointed uh, for men to die once, but after the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those that eagerly wait for him, and I hope that's we're included among those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time 
apart from sin for salvation. And it's kind of interesting he's talking about salvation as this future thing. Because a lot of times we think we have our salvation. And we do have a salvation with Christ that we're, we are forgiven. But the salvation we, we're looking forward to is that future uh, sal- salvation. So it's interesting here. So again, and, and this is just this is a couple of verses here. And we see allusions. And a lot of people hopefully see the allusions to the Day of Atonement here. Entering the holy place. I think it's the thing with the priesthood did. And again, this occurred, right, historically. This was, he, Christ sacrifice was the Passover sacrifice, was on the Passover. Because uh, in, in John one twenty nine, just to quote it and I've turned there, because John the Baptist says to Christ, he, he says to him, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. We all remember that. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God. And 1 Corinthians 5, say, uh, 5 7 says that Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So, that, so definitely what we have on that day, and Christ, the crucifixion, was the Passover, but we're referencing it here on, on atonement, here in the fall. And so that, that's why in my mind, and, and a lot of times we look at it, say maybe this is somewhat like a fall version of Passover. And again, when we look at God's holy days, we actually see fulfillments by Jesus. Fulfillments that were, I guess, prophesied, and they actually were fulfilled on the actual day. Because, you know, Christ our Passover was sacrificed on Passover. And Passover is described as a burnt offering. And you had the, remember the blood on the doorpost was put from, from the actual Passover so that the deaf angel would, would, would pass over that house. And, and it was you know, described as a burnt offering, not necessarily described as a sin offering. If you look into the details, it's described as a burnt offering. But we do know that Christ was, our, was a sin offering. And again, we, we remember we take, we take the bread and the wine as signs of the covenant. You know, those are signs of the covenant. Uh, a sign, you know, another sign we enter into covenant is when we were baptized. We, we enter into the covenant. And so, we, so in Passover, we look to Christ's sacrifice for our forgiveness of sins. I think we all, we talk about that, and that's what Passover means. And then we have, uh, Christ was resurrected during unleavened bread. And he, you know, became for us the bread that we live by. We, we talk about that. And he offers himself as the wave sheave offering during the eleven bread. So there's a connection again. This is, this is things that were prophesied that, that were in God's holy days that Christ actually fulfilled and did. Uh, later at Pentecost, in that same year, what did Jesus do? He gave the Holy Spirit to the church. And so we see a Pentecost was a holy day that had things that were associated with it, and then Christ fulfilled that day. So we're going to skip over, or we're going to go to two of trumpets, skip two of trumpets in the fall. And I guess we all, most of we agree uh, that when we read about trumpets and we talk about trumpets, we talk, we're talking about the return of Christ. Do we, we kind of agree on that? that the, the trumpets uh, is, is about the return of Christ. We, we talk about the last trumpet. And again, no one knows the day or the hour, but if I were to make a bet, I would wager that Christ would return on trumpets. If I was going to make a bet, I don't know when that's going to be, and probably at the time that happens, there's going to be so much chaos, nobody will know what day it is. That's what I imagine. But if I were going to make a bet, I'd put my money on trumpets being, you know, the, again, that's the, that is, and it, is going, it is the fulfillment of Christ's return, whether it's that day or not. But, you know, kind of, in our mind, we kind of think that, don't we? A lot of us think that because we see, these, we see this pattern of Christ's fulfillment throughout the holy days. All right, so we're going to skip over atonement. We'll get back to atonement here. So atonement, where does atonement fit into this? Because uh, we're going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles next week, and which we see as representing, among many things, you know, I see a Tabernacles represents our temp- temporary life. We talk about that a lot, but you know, importantly, we 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 link, look at Tabernacles as representing the millennial reign of Christ. There's a lot of scripture that connects the millennial reign of, of Christ with Tabernacles, <laughs> you know, Zechariah. There's all it's all over, and so when we, we talk about these days, we say, well, there's a fulfillment of this. Uh, of these days we're going to keep this, that is yet to come than when Christ returns. And we look at the last great day, the great white throne judgment. And again, all these, you know, God's appointed times have different fulfillments throughout the years, but these are what we generally think about. So where does atonement uh, fit into this fulfillment prophetic scheme? And now I'm, I'm going to get to that, but it's going to be the last thing I'm going to get to, because <laughs> I have to answer the question, what makes atonement unique? Why is today not just another Passover? Because it's not. It's actually, there's a unique purpose for, for, for atonement. 
And it really makes the Passover more meaningful. It makes all the holy days fit together make more meaningful when we understand what atonement is. And we see the word atonement in God's word not used exclusively for this day, right? This is the day of atonement, but there's atonement happening in other times in God's word. There's a lot of atonement that we can read about. And usually when we're reading in the Old Testament, we read atonement in relation to the, to the work of the priest, and especially the high priest, we'll see this, this mentioned. And on you know, special occasions, they, there's atonements talked about. So I'm going to look at a few of these, these occasions uh, and see how they relate. So we're, first is going to be in Exodus 29. This was a special occasion, but it's Exodus 29. And the word, you know, it mentions atonement. So I'm going to see what, what it's talking about, what's being atoned in Exodus 29. And we're looking at verse 35. This is the point where I normally would get my water, but I'm like, it's a habit, like, whoop, I can't do that now. All right. <laughs> Thus shall you do to Aaron and his sons, verse 35, according to all that I have commanded you. Seven days you shall consecrate them. So this was a, for this purpose. And you shall offer a bull every day as a sin offering for atonement. So, that, so, so, so here we have atonement connected to a bull being offered for a sin offering, and it's done for atonement. He said, you shall cleanse the altar when you make atonement for it, and you shall anoint it and sanctify it. So now also the atonement for sin offering, but the, the atonement is being applied to the altar. So atonement is something that can be applied to, I guess, you know, it's like an inanimate object. It's an object used for God's service in, God, in God's temple, but it says the atonement on the altar, and you shall anoint it and sanctify it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and sanctify it, set it apart. So again, he talks about sin offering, but the the atonement's being mentioned mentioned as being made atonement for the altar. And the altar shall be most holy, and whatever touches the altar must be holy. So it's very interesting that the atonement here refers refers to that. And here the priests are offering a sacrifice. And they're using the sacrifice to make the, you know, the atonement for the altar. Again, I don't think the, the altar didn't commit any sins. The altar, right, we, you know, altar, you know, altars don't commit sins. What, what altars need atonement? And, what, and, and, and sacrifice is something the, the priests are providing, I guess, really to kind of set apart, set apart the altar, right, to so sanctify it, and to cleanse the altar. So there's, so there's a part of atonement that has to do with sanctification and cleansing. And it's interesting, we'll look at what the word, what word atonement means and how that relates, as we can see what, what our atonement's about. All right, so Leviticus 4. We'll see another example here. Leviticus 4. And we'll read through this quickly because it goes through a lot of details. But you guys want to go to the details so you can hear them. Leviticus 4, verse 3 says, Now the whole generation of Israel sins unintentionally. I get, we, we do that too, don't we? we, we sin, a lot of us maybe sin intentionally, but we, we, we do a lot of sins that are unintentional. And the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done something against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which should not be done and are guilty. Uh, verse 14, When the sin which they have committed becomes known... Then the assembly shall offer a young bull for the sin and bring it before the tabernacle of meeting. Verse 15. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull before the Lord, and the bull shall be killed before the Lord. And the, the anointed priest shall bring some of the bull's blood to the tabernacle of meeting. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the veil. So this is a very, very elaborate ceremony. Killing the blood and then sprinkling. Uh, and he shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar, which is before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall pour the remaining blood at the base of the altar of burnt offering, which is the door of the tabernacle of meeting. He shall take all the fat from it and burn it on the altar. And shall do with the bull as he did with the bull of the sin offering, thus shall he do it. So, so the priest shall make atonement for them, and it shall be forgiven them. So all this, this ceremony and things are done is being made. Now this is being done to make atonement for unintentional sin. So we, again, we talked about atonement for the altar. Now we have atonement being made. For unintentional sin, and God gives 
this is the procedure, which, you know, if I had to follow that procedure, I don't know if I could do it because it really, you know, seems complicated to me, uh, those type of things. But it's a complicated procedure. But again, you know, cleansing them and we have forgiveness. All right, so let's go to Leviticus 11. I mean, Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16. And here's where we see uh, the Day of Atonement described in detail. We're going to look at just parts, parts of what we see here as it, as it relates to what we read about atonement. Again, this is talking about Aaron, you know, Aaron who is the high priest. And we're going to look in uh, verse, verse 3 here for, for a second. Leviticus 16, verse 3. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering, as a ram as a burnt offering. And he shall put the holy linen tunic and linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with linen slash and with linen turban. He shall be attired. These are his holy garments. And therefore he shall wash his body in water and put them on. And shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. So you got two goats and you got a ram. So again, this is, this is a detailed uh, description of what, what's going on here. And again, it's related to this day, because, you know, it's talking about this day, <laughs> the Day of Atonement. Uh, verse 6, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. So that's the purpose of the bull, that he can make atonement for him. All right. He shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots for two goats, one lot for the Lord and one lot for the scapegoats. So he's going to decide, the part of the ritual, he's, he casts the lots and there's two goats. Now one becomes this goat and one becomes this goat. And Aaron shall bring the goat, verse 9, on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it. So here we have, he's talking about the atonement was on him for this, and he said, now we're going to have a, make atonement upon the goat and to let it go as a scapegoat into the wilderness. So we have, you know, the atonement applied in different, different situations. So like the altar was made atonement, as we read earlier, the goat set apart, right, the goat set apart by these lots, uh, by casting lots, and atonement is made upon, upon the goat, again, rich, richly set apart, and I guess cleansed for that holy purpose that this goat is going to perform in this ritual. Verse 15, so let's get to verse 15. Then you shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, because he had his own, he had a bull for him. Bring his blood inside the veil, right, inside the Holy of Holies. Do that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat, and before the mercy seat, so it shall make atonement for the holy place. So here he says the atonement is being made for, we have the, we have the altar, we have the goat, and now we have the holy place, the holy of holies. He's making atonement for the holy place. All right, so the sin offering would make the people, the sin offering was for the people, and the sprinkling of the blood of the atonement for the holy place. All right, continue in verse 16. And he explains why he's doing this. Because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins, and so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So he's doing this ceremonial, making atonement for the place and for, for all these things because of their sins, because of their uncleanness. Now, the English word atonement is a translation uh, from the, we should know if we, we're keeping this, this day, right, Yom Kippur. It's the Hebrew word uh, Kippur, or Kippur, or however I, I mispronounce it, uh, is related, this is the word Kippur is related to the, the name of the covering of the ark. So we may be aware of this. And so the covering of the ark, the, the mercy seat, so the ark of the covenant, uh, it was called the Kaporet, the Kaporet, the mercy seat. And, you know, the Ark of the Covenant, I always imagine the one in Raiders of the Lost Ark, when I try to get an idea of, you have the, the cherubim that we have, and we have, they're kind of over the Ark, and there's that little part in the middle. <laughs> and that little covering right there is the caporet, which is the mercy seat. It has a gold lid. And this is where, you know, when, when he's bringing these sacrifices in on the Day of Atonement, this is where the presence of God 
is in this area, uh, the, 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 the kippuret, the kaporet. So, so, so again, the word kippur, kippur was not a word until after <laughs> we have a description for what, what, this, what this is, from what, you know, from what the language people say. So again, so kippur, atonement, is directly related to the Ark of the Covenant and to God's presence right there in that Holy of Holies. So, so again, it's, it's, it's interesting that like our English word for atonement, we may just think, well, that just means forgiveness. But I think, as we'll see here, atonement goes beyond forgiveness. It's, 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 it's a word that's more important because it has to deal with the Holy of Holies and God's presence and what God is doing. And so, so it's, again, there's atonement made for the altar, atonement made for certain things. Verse 20, it says, And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting, and the altar. All right, so that's the three things. He's, he's you know, the atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle, the altar. He should bring the live goat. After the, you know, atoning for these three things. In verse 21, And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and their transgressions concerning all their sins, put them on the head of the goat, and he shall send it away in the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. And down to verse 29. And this shall be a statute forever until you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls. And we're doing that, right? We're not doing, we're not, we don't have any goats or bulls or anything right here or a holy place. We don't have a temple. But we are afflicting our souls. I mean, I feel, I feel a little bit afflicted. I feel a lot more afflicted <laughs> as the day, day, day goes on. And do no work at all. Whether it be one of your, your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So again, the afflicting our souls and not working, that doesn't really bring atonement. That is kind of our response, right? So because this is being done right back then, He's telling them, because they, you know, the high priest is doing all these rituals and we're doing these things with goats and bulls, you are afflict yourself because of this. You know, the, you know, this day is holy. And the entire process, right, so this entire process with atonement for the high priest, atonement for the scapegoat, atonement for the altar, for the holy place, brings atonement to the people. The whole, so the whole process is described here as bringing atonement to the people. And again, it's that, that word kippur, which really has a little bit more different meaning than what we would think the English word atonement means. You know, cleansing from sin, being set apart. Now, now how does this relate to what we read in Hebrews? Let's go to Hebrews 7, and we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can relate this. Hebrews 7. Because I, I say, well, uh, well, Passover, when we keep Passover, we enter into the covenant with God, and our sins are forgiven, and we, we do the signs of the covenant. Atonement is about the work of the priesthood. It's about the work of the priesthood that... You know, if we've been in the church long enough, we know who the priesthood, our high priest is Jesus Christ. It's the work that Jesus Christ does for us. So atonement, like I said earlier, goes beyond forgiveness. And we'll see, see, see this in, in what we read here. It's actually more. So Hebrews 7, verse 23, says, Also there were many priests, because they were prevented by death from continuing. <laughs> right? they, they kept dying off, and we had to get more priests. So yeah, there's always new priests. Because they, they don't live forever. But he, speaking of Christ, speaking of Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. And so, and this is the thing about understanding God's law, and we're not going to get into those details, but the thing, really true thing to understand when we, is that that the reason why we don't have that priesthood, the reason why we don't do the goats and all that, is because Jesus Christ is a high priest, and there's, there's a new priesthood that Jesus Christ is a high priest, and his, 
priesthood is what accomplishes the atonement for us. All right, and it's what it says. Therefore, he also is able to save the uttermost to those who come to God through him, verse 25, since he always lives to make intercession for them. To make intercession for them. So that's a work, that's a work of, the, of a priest. And again, atonement goes beyond forgiveness. Verse 25, he says, He is also able to save the utmost those who come to God through him, since he is always lives to make intercession for them. So intercession on our behalf, on our behalf is the work of the high priest. Verse 26, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate for sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Because we read about what the other high priest had to do. He had to get new clothes. He had to sacrifice for himself, all these different things that Christ didn't have to do because he was perfect. He says, who, verse 27, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, verse 27, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Again, so he doesn't have to cleanse himself. Doesn't have to cleanse the temple, doesn't have to cleanse the altar. Verse 28, for the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son of God who has been perfected forever. Verse, chapter 8, verse 1. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So again, so, so if we're looking at the difference between Passover and atonement, Passover, we have Christ as the lamb, the Passover lamb. Atonement, we have Christ as our high priest. So that's the big difference, and those are different roles where, where atonement goes beyond just the forgiveness of sins. Who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. So we're going to look at what roles of the high priest does Jesus perform in our atonement? So what does he do as high priest? What does he do for us? What is, what is Christ doing for us today and throughout our lives that the high priest that we read about could never really, really do? And, and Christ performs those roles. That's important. This day of atonement, Christ as high priest performs this atonement for us. So Hebrews, I'm going to go back to Hebrews 4 just for a couple of verses. In uh, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. One, one of the things that Christ does for us is, uh, and this is, my, this is one of my favorite things, because it's one of the things I think I need the most of. Uh, Hebrews 4, verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are without sin. In verse 16, Hebrews 4, he says, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So here, you know, we, we said we can come boldly to, to the high priest. And, again, and this is something, when you need grace, when you need mercy from God, you don't really feel very bold about asking for it. But he says, no, you can come whenever you need mercy. And I tell you, since I've been baptized, you know, I've need, have you needed mercy throughout your life since, since we've been walking this walk? We need mercy, and we need grace. And, 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 the, and our high priest, one of the roles of the high priest is that he is a source for us of grace and mercy whenever we need it. Whenever we need grace and mercy. And that's part of our atonement. Part of our atonement. Kapoor. Because we're being prepared. We're being prepared. We'll, we'll get into that. We're, we're being prepared. Just like the altar was being prepared. Just like all the, all the preparations that the, the priest was making. Christ is making preparations with us. So think about that connection between the preparations the high priest made preparing for atonement and what Christ is doing with us making preparations. Romans 8, uh, just a couple of verses, Romans 8, verse 26. As, as Christ is high priest, it says, Likewise the Spirit 
also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us. You know, when we talk about God's Spirit, we're talking about Jesus Christ in us. Right? Jesus in us, through his Spirit, makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In verse 27. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the, of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So that's part of this grace and mercy, this intercession. Because there's a lot of things, there's times, I, there's things I need about me that need to be changed or need to be forgiven or need, I need help that I, I, I might not even be aware of. But God, through his grace and mercy, as far as I priest, does that for me. So he's our source of grace, mercy, and intercession. And I don't know about you, I need it. We need it. All right, back to Hebrews and Hebrews. We'll look at Hebrews nine. Look at look at another another role of Christ as our high priest and what He does for us in this atonement. Hebrews nine verse one. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is not of this creation. Actually, I'm reading, I'm reading actually verse eleven. I'm sorry, in verse twelve of Hebrews nine. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And it says, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, right? We talked about that. We have blood. And again, I, I, I've never, I mean, yeah, yeah, who, who here lives on a farm who's killed, who's killed a bull before or a goat or something? You probably have, I have not. <laughs> So I don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a connection to this. I don't really understand. To me, it seems gross, very gross. and just, I don't have a connection with, with sacrificing animals. It's not something I understand, but you may understand this. All right. He says, but not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy. He says, uh, for, 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 for the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. Verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So that's what I want to focus on, that last little statement. That's, that's, that's a part of atonement that, the, that the, our high priest is doing for us. He's cleansing our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And again, we, we have... Before we we've lived the life of sin, we've done things we we regret. We all we all agree on that. We've done things we probably regret. Uh, there's sins that we have that we want to put a, put away from us. And part of atonement is those sins, those things. You know, because again, if, if 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 Christ was not involved in here, right? Imagine if Christ is not involved. And I'm just going to say, hey, I'm going to I'm going to sacrifice this goat here. We're going to go here. We're going to kill this goat. All right, y'all sins are forgiven. What is that really? What is what, that? That's just like a symbolic, you know, and we see what it does. But what Christ is doing, he's saying, my blood is so precious, right? It's not a goat. It's so precious that it's so perfect that your conscience now, your mind can be changed so that these sins, that you, the things that you had in your past are things that may, because if we're just having a goat or something, our sins could hold us back. We, we still have the guilt. We still have the uh, behaviors and the patterns in our lives that we continue to sin, right? Because that, that's the way sin is. Just, just sacrificing a goat doesn't change who you are. <laughs> it's just a, it's just blood. But what Christ says he can do is he can cleanse your conscience so that your mind is able to serve him, serve the living God. And that's a change, change in mind. So atonement from Christ is expressed. The first thing we, we saw, we have a never-ending source of grace, mercy, an intercession for us from our high priest. And our mind, right, our conscience, is cleansed of the sinful nature. All right, one more aspect. One more aspect in, in Hebrews 10 of, of the high priest. Hebrews 10, and we'll look at verse 11. And every high priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. It's kind of, you know, all right. we'll, we'll look at that. It says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, 
sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit, verse 15, also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is no remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. All right, so the third thing we read here is that atonement... After our minds are cleared of sin, atonement brings God's laws into our heart. That's part of the covenant. It's part of the, the role of high priest that Christ, as he's performing the, the, the atonement for us, that he is actually writing the laws into our hearts. Or he's actively changing our character, where it becomes our nature to obey God, rather than just we're doing it from the word, you know. So these three aspects, our never-ending source of grace, mercy, intercession, our mind cleansed of a sinful nature, and Jesus Christ transforming our character, which is our laws written on our heart. So what so, so we read there, the writer of Hebrews says, animal sacrifice well, it can never take away sins, right? We just read that. <laughs> and they were doing these things, and they were, really ne- they, were always, they were never meant to take away sins because they were only can point to what Jesus can do. Right? Again, if, if, I, if I were to bring a goat in here and kill it and say, this is, gonna, this is for, for our sins, that doesn't, that doesn't, what does that do? It's just the goat. <laughs> it's just the blood. Christ can do it. Christ can change you, forgive you your sins. Now, the prophetic aspect. So I said there's a prophetic aspect. There's a fulfillment in God's perfect plan. We talked about from Passover to Tabernacles. And where does, where, where does the atonement fit into this fulfillment? About what God is doing, what Christ our high priest is doing in our lives, in, 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 in the atonement that he's bringing to us. We're going to Revelation 20. I'm only going to look at one verse, but to summarize Revelation 20, this is right after Christ's return. So, so if we're going in prophetic fulfillment of holy days, we say, well, this will be after trumpets. Uh, this is after Christ's return. And, and in Revelation 20, we have a description of Satan being put away for a thousand years. And then we have a description of... Of us, which I, I say, I hope it's us. I hope when I'm reading this, when I read this, these people who are talked about here, <laughs> I hope I'm reading about us. I want to be a part of that. And I say, hey, that's us. And again, remember what I said, you know, the, the high priest, what we read, and again, maybe, you know, all these details that we read in Leviticus and things, is a lot of times, you know, I could read those details of Bible study and maybe just oh, I fall asleep because it's all these different details. But we all these details, all these things that Aaron had to do to, to cleanse the altar, right? To get everything prepared for atonement for the people, right? Because the, the high priest had to make atonement uh, for himself. Christ, you know, Christ didn't need to do that. <laughs> uh, but the, the high priest had to make atonement for the holy place. Right, the Holy of Holies, the altar, the tabernacle. And these are cleansed, right? These are set apart. These are done. So if we see what it, what it says there, so that the people of Israel, so they receive atonement because of what the high priest did with all these different uh, things that were done. So I would ask you, and this is something we, we probably should know, we, uh, in Revelation 20, wh- what is a tabernacle? What is the tabernacle at this point? When Christ has returned. What, or, or maybe who is a tabernacle <laughs> when Christ returns? I would say, and again, there's plenty of good evidence <laughs> to suggest when Christ returns, we're, we're, you know, the tabernacle, and as, as, as can be proved repeated in other places I'm not going to go to, that we are, right? We are the temple of God, and that God, when we talk about the holy place, on this day of atonement, guess where that is right now? It's inside of us. The Holy of Holies, 
That's why it's important to be, be mindful. It's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's the people of God. It's God's temple. Because, I mean, the Ark of the Covenant, right, the, the, the Kippurette, right, with the, with the cherubim and all that there where God would appear in that. You think of the Ark of the Covenant. And what, what was in the Ark of the Covenant? Uh, there was God's law was in the Ark of the Covenant, right? So if you, were, if you were able to open that up and look in there, which, you know, I guess you would die if you did. That's what would happen. But if you're able to look in there, the Ark of the Covenant, that's God's laws were inside of that Ark. Uh, there was also, what, manna was inside the Ark? And I think of the bread of life. I think of Jesus Christ. I think, what does manna represent? That was inside the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, there was, a, there was a, the, the rod that budded was in the Ark of the Covenant. And I think of fruit, right, bearing fruit. So I think of all the things that are in the Ark of the Covenant. I think, you know what? We're the Ark of the Covenant. Because the covenant, who represents the new covenant? Who was the new covenant made with, but with God's people? <laughs> we are that Ark of the Covenant. We are the Holy of Holies. We are the temple. And so at this point in history, we read in, in Revelation 20, we will be resurrected, we will be perfected, we will be perfectly cleansed, and we will be set apart for a purpose. We will be atoned at this point. We will be atoned. And verse 6 says, Revelation 20, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. So, so, so after Christ returns, the process of atonement begins for everybody in God's world, right, in the kingdom. The grace and mercy and intercession, their minds being cleansed. So the, you know, and again, I can, I can turn to the scriptures and show you where this is going to happen. Their minds being uh, cleansed, the sinful nature receiving God's spirit, Christ transforming the, words, the world's character, the laws written on the hearts of those you know, in, in, the, in the kingdom that, were, that will be there. Atonement. At this point, we're reading Revel Revelation 20, it's going to be worldwide. The, the tabernacle of being cleansed and atoned for, the high priest will do his job. God's plan is amazing. And so we'll, we'll, as we keep this day of atonement, we've got to continue to always look to our high priest who's bringing our atonement. Thank you, Jeff. Very inspire, inspiring words about the love of Jesus. He loves us so much. Uh, if you'll take your hymnals now, and we'll conclude services today by turning to 197 and rise. We'll sing, Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. And after this, we'll have Mr. John Meadey lead us in a closing prayer. Then we'll sing, He is Lord. Take up thy cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I gave my life to rest. Surrender your all today. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever
heaven we humbly come before you today very thankful for the understanding that you've given us and the opening our minds to your truth as to what this day pictures we thank you especially for the sacrifice of your son who did become our high priest what all he went through for each of us so that we could have a part of your life and the things that lie beyond we just ask that you would help us to always remember that to realize what he went through for each of us we thank you, Father, for being a part of our lives. We just ask that you would be with each one today, wherever your people are gathered together, to help us to have the fellowship and the camaraderie that we need and to learn to love one another. We just ask, Father, that you be with your people as we begin to go our separate ways for the feast and to help us to return here safely. We give you thanks for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Y'all have a safe journey to and from the feast. We'll see you when you get back.